Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to PNP Live. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. We're delighted to have with us uh, this afternoon historian Bruce Ragsdale, uh, who will be talking about his new, new book, Washington at the Plow, The Founding Farmer and the Question of Slavery. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. Uh, to post a question at any point, just click on the uh, Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Washington at the Plow. Uh, Bruce uh, has uh, served for two decades as director of the Federal Judicial History Office at the Federal Judicial Center. Uh, and he also uh, worked uh, for, for eight years as, uh, as an associate historian of the U.S. House of Representatives. He's also written several previous books on George Washington's agricultural and commercial enterprises and on the revolutionary era in Virginia. Uh, now, when most of us think of George Washington, we recall his roles as a wartime general, and as America's first president. But for most of Washington's life, uh, he also was a farmer. In fact, he spent more of his working life farming than he did at war or in political office and he found in the routines of farming at uh, Mount Vernon a personal gratification seen nowhere else in his life. So as Bruce wonderfully explains in his illuminating new book about Washington, the farmer, uh, it's revealing and important uh, to, uh, to explore this side of the founding father for several reasons. First, it provides a window on Washington's personality that's not as clear elsewhere Certain traits about Washington come through when you look at how he managed his farms, uh, traits that expand the more common portrait of him as uh, this revered stoic leader. Second, Washington was actually a great agricultural innovator as Bruce uh, is gonna elaborate on in, in a minute. And this commitment to agricultural improvement and belief in a new agricultural order were at the core of Washington's vision of and expectations for the new nation. And third, the evolution of Washington's thinking about slavery was tied to his attempts to make the enslaved workforce at Mount Vernon more productive. These efforts eventually led Washington to become disillusioned with forced labor, which helps explain his decision to include in his will a provision to free his slaves after his death. Bruce, Bruce details all this in a, in a lucid, compelling narrative that both uh, deepens and complicates our understanding of George Washington. Publishers Weekly called Washington at the Plow fascinating and richly informative and a must read for fans of early American history. And I, I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, Bruce will be in conversation this afternoon with Cynthia Kierner, a history professor at George Mason University who specializes in early American women and gender and early Southern history. She's also the author or editor of eight books and many articles. So Bruce and Cynthia, the screen is yours. Okay, well, I am super excited to be here today talking to Bruce about his terrific new book and um, listening to him sort of expand on um, some of the themes that were brought up in the introduction. And I think probably the best way for our audience um, to start this discussion is just to have Bruce tell us Tell us a little bit about the book. Uh, this is um, surprisingly, it's the first book length study of Washington as a farmer based on his voluminous correspondence about agriculture and also on his very detailed financial and plantation accounts, many of which have not been published. And they were really the core of, of my research base here. And it explores what I think of as the, the least familiar dimension of the most familiar American. Um, and people know he was a farmer, but they don't know much beyond that or think of it sort of just as a rural, rural amusement. Um, as Brad said, Washington spent more time farming than he did in military service or in political office. And he always said it was the activity best suited to his disposition. It was what he was best fitted to um, work at. It was more rewarding, he said, than any succession of military victories. Um, and it was clearly what he, he most enjoyed um, doing. But I think farming was also, he saw it as a kind of public service and that he saw what he was doing as a farmer uh, was 
to serve um, a larger purpose um, in both clone, late colonial Virginia, um, where he led the transition from away from tobacco and toward wheat and, and flour production. And then again, after the revolution, when he saw his model of diversified uh, farming as probably the most promising foundation of the commercial prosperity of the, of the new nation. Um, uh, throughout his life as a farmer, Washington relied almost exclusively on enslaved agriculture, cultural labor. And so the story of Washington the farmer is the story of Washington the enslaver. And, and it's the um, record and, and um, um, documentation of his life as a farmer that um, provides what is by far the most illuminating and um, um, best explanation of his engagement with the institution of slavery, his changing attitude toward um, slavery, and also his daily interaction with um, the enslaved. Um, and um, it was here in his life as a farmer more than in any other part of his life that we can trace his eventual um, coming to a new reckoning um, with slavery after the Revolutionary War. And um, it was really as a farmer that he first confronts um, the, the paradox of slavery and freedom that runs throughout the Revolutionary era. Um, Washington said very, very little about his famous decision to emancipate all the enslaved people he controlled uh, through his will. Um, and the most complete record we can find of that decision making process is through his final reorganization of farming at, at Mount Vernon. And so that ends up being um, the culmination of the book is how the farming um, objectives and his reckoning with slavery come together in the late 1790s. So there are, I mean, lots, of, I was going to ask you why you wrote the book, but I think you just gave us a lot of compelling reasons. And, um, you know, particularly this idea of, um, you know, dealing with Washington, not only as an enslaver, but then as someone who, you know, really kind of uniquely um, frees all of his enslaved people, which is something obviously that, that is very timely and very important. Um, one of the things that you make really clear in the book is that Farming was central to Washington's public image during his lifetime, that everybody knew that George Washington was a farmer. Um, I don't think that most people today, though, think of Washington as the founding farmer, which is the way you put it in your subtitle. I think if you, you know, went up to the average American who knew anything about history, and maybe most especially people who don't know anything about history, and said, well, you know, when you hear the words founding farmer, who do you think of? Um, they would say Jefferson, they wouldn't say Washington. Um, why do you think that's the case? It's certainly the case now. And uh, when I've given presentations on this as I did my research or when I meet with um, a, a teacher's institute at Mount Vernon every year, I, that's the most frequent question I get. Was he, was he as serious a farmer as Jefferson? And the answer is he was a much, much more serious farmer than Jefferson. Um, and during his lifetime, Washington was considered the farmer of the era. He's probably the most celebrated farmer on either side of the Atlantic in the years after the Revolutionary War. Um, very much celebrated as a farmer in Great Britain as well as in the United States. It's interesting, when, when Jefferson um, came back from France, he decided he wanted to implement um, at Monticello, the same kind of agricultural improvements that Washington had initiated at Mount Vernon. And he turns to Washington for guidance and for advice. He um, meets with him in Philadelphia. They go out to visit um, what were model farms in the Philadelphia area. They go to see the demonstration of farming implements. Jefferson goes to Mount Vernon and um, Washington takes him out in to the uh, commercial farming areas and shows him how to do the crop rotations. Um, and they, they have, it's actually their, their most amicable bond at the, exactly the same time that otherwise their relationship is, is fraying. Um, Jefferson goes back to Monticello and tries to implement this kind of farming. It doesn't last very long at it. Um, for one thing, um, what Washington was undertaking was hugely expensive and it required years before um, someone knew if their investments were going to pay off. And Jefferson, he couldn't afford it. And also the hillsides at Monticello were not well suited for um, this kind of crop rotation. Um, so he turns farming over to his tenants and his family pretty soon. Um, it, it's in the 20th century that their um, reputations are reversed. And it's particularly dur during the New Deal era. 
And it was Jefferson's association with the yeoman farmer and idealization of, of the family farm um, that Jefferson comes to be seen as, as one of the foundations of his, his praise of farming as one of the foundations of American democracy. Um, and since then, people just, and, and I also think the, the contrast between Jefferson and, and Hamilton always puts Jefferson in the um, position of farmer, but certainly during their um, lifetime, um, Washington was seen as the farmer of the era. And it's one of the things I'm trying to do is, is restore his reputation here. That's absolutely fascinating, the historical memory bit of this, or I mean, I guess more accurately, the historical forgetting of it. Um, part of it probably is also that there are so many other kind of concrete big things that Washington is remembered for. I mean, he's the general in the revolution. He's the guy they surrendered to at Yorktown. He is the first president and even people who don't really care much or understand much about the politics of the early republic know that being a first is a big deal and it seems like all of that is kind of overshadowed um this obviously very important part um of washington's life not only from his perspective of what he thought of himself but what other people thought of him as well um he, so, I, yeah go ahead no i was going to say that there's a visitor who comes to mount vernon and um a british visitor in 1785 and he writes home and says that washington's greatest pride following the revolutionary war is to be considered the first farmer of america and it's one of the things i was setting out to do is why would this accolade be so important to this man who had just um secured the independence of the United States. It was I just, it's role. like one of those Super Bowl commercials, right? It's, we just won the Super Bowl. Now I'm going to Disney World. I was just the president. I just beat George III, but now I'm going to go be a farmer. It's that, that, that's totally awesome. Um, all right. So, I mean, someone's sort of going into a bookstore not at Mount Vernon um, and seeing yet another book on George Washington. Um, Washington is obviously an incredibly well-known historical figure. There have been tons of biographies written about him. Um, he is the subject of other kinds of historical writing as well. Um, your overarching argument in this book, which you touched on in the intro, but which I'd like to sort of consider a little more explicitly here, is that, and I'm quoting here, the story of Washington's life as a farmer fundamentally reshapes the familiar biography of the general and president. So can you give us a few examples, um, you know, to whet the appetites of people who haven't read your book yet um, to sort of illustrate that point? Yeah, um, yeah farm, farming was never just a private enterprise for Washington, that um, his view, vision of farming, even as it changes, is always connected with his vision of, of the political economy, first of colonial Virginia and then of of the new nation. And, and he sees what he's doing is, as setting an example for others um, to follow and to establish a new economic foundation. He certainly thinks that before the Revolutionary War when he sees his transition to wheat and, um, and exploring new markets for, for, um, for flour um, from Mount Vernon, that it's a way of breaking away from the restrictions of, of the British Empire. Uh, by, by that time, Washington is convinced that the empire is no longer protecting the interests of Virginians, let alone serving the interests as it once had. And he um, wants to explore commercial opportunities outside the restrictions of empire, and the wheat trade is not covered by the Navigation Acts. And, and as he becomes more and more involved with the political resistance to Great Britain, those farming goals become all that much more, more important. And, and again, following um, the Revolutionary War, he's um, this goes back also to the Jefferson comparison. And um, I think because of his alliance with Hamilton, people think Washington's not as dedicated to uh, a agricultural future for America, but he was completely as much as Jefferson, even if it was a slightly different one. And he says again and again that it, that's the agricultural um, produce of um, particularly the grain producing areas of the United States that will both bring the respect of other nations and will also be the foundation of commercial prosperity. He's looking forward to what he thinks of as a, a post mercantilist world in which the United States and European nations are exchanging their reciprocal advantages. And for the United States, that's, um, that's commercial agriculture. Um, so it fits with those larger goals. He also 
I mean, he, he's extremely interested in a way that's not typical of um, the United States, although it was of Great Britain at the time. He's very, very interested in stewardship of the soil, or restoration of the fertility. And he sees that not just as a way of maintaining the value of his own land, although that's that's part of it. But he also thinks that um, one of the great challenges facing the United States is that people just, they wear out the land and move to another area. And he sees that as a source of political instability. He sees it as kind of um, um, uh, um, moving toward uh, other spheres of influence like the French and the British in the West. And he wants to establish these commercial connections that will unite the nation. And he also wants to establish the kind of farming practices that will promote what, what he calls progressive seeding, meaning a very slow advance into new areas, which he thinks is essential for political stability. He also, I think naively, also believes it will somehow reduce um, uh, conflict with the Indian nations that are being dispossessed by um, the westward settlement. Oh, that's really interesting. That, that's, that's really interesting. And I mean, there is that, that, that one of the parts of the book that I really liked a lot was when he made his tour down to South Carolina and sort of looked at what he considered to be the inefficient and wasteful agricultural methods there. And, you know, which I'm sure probably did cast a shadow a bit over this optimism of agriculture is going to save us if you got these people down there who aren't interested in doing it the right way. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that those are all, you know, really interesting points. And, and, you know, I mean, I had this experience once that I was supposed to review um, a volume of edited Washington papers um, from 1775. So it's like right before the revolution. And I expected to read all of these kind of interesting letters about, you know, the coming of the revolution and politics and all of that in this big fat book. There was one letter that mentioned politics. Every letter mentioned wheat. But I mean, one of the things that your book does is to say, to tell us that, you know, George Washington's preoccupation with wheat was not necessarily a political, but in fact was very much tied to um, the things that people were thinking in terms of the politics of the British empire and how they weren't really working for um, a lot of Americans um, anymore. One of the other things that I found really surprising um, and interesting in the book is, um, well, I mean, I've read a fair amount about Washington and most historians and biographers depict him as a man of action. You know, he's the tall guy on the horse, you know, leading troops into battle or fox hunting or, you know, whatever. Um, they don't really depict Washington very much as a man of ideas. Um, but your Washington was someone who read a lot and who thought really deeply um, about a lot of issues, most notably um, agricultural methods and their larger implications. And in fact, he was a card carrying member of this transatlantic network of people who exchanged information and ideas about farming all the time. So can you tell us a bit about that network, who was in it and how did Washington sitting in you know, remote Northern Virginia make those connections and foster them over such a long period? Um, from the time he comes back to Mount Vernon to, to manage it full time right after he marries um, Martha Custis in 1759, one of the first things he does is he writes his um, London tobacco merchants and asks for a list of agricultural books. And they are all books that have nothing to do with tobacco. They have to do with this revolution in agriculture in mid century, mid 18th century Great Britain. Somehow Washington already knows about this movement and he puts together what is one of the most advanced libraries on, of practical agricultural treatises. And so his initial engagement with this kind of farming is mostly through books. But these books, they do introduce him to what's called the new husbandry. It's, a, it's new style of farming that tries to um, make, make a much more intensive agriculture to keep um, the soil restored to the, um, uh, and it, it brought about 
about a 50% increase in grain production in Great Britain. But it also is a whole world of these self-defined gentlemen farmers that Washington is very, very attracted to. And these practical treatises are all written by or talk about this culture of farmers who, um, they're gentlemen farmers, but they're actively involved in the day-to-day -day, um, work of farming. They also um, are part of a community of exchanging information and uh, belonging to agricultural societies, of promoting these kinds of publication. And the, the the story of these people really resonates with, with Washington, and it puts him in a new role as a Virginia planter. It gives him a new role as, as setting an example and, and really controlling or at least influencing the direction of, of agricultural um, development in um, uh, um, Virginia. After the Revolutionary War, he is personally participating in these communications. And he develops these um, really fascinating correspondences with some of the most important agricultural leaders in Great Britain. The most notable were um, Arthur Young, who was the editor of a very influential journal called the Annals of Agriculture. And the other one um, is men, Sir John Sinclair, who was the founding president of the British Board of Agriculture. And there's still an exchange of practical information and Washington relies on them for seeds and plow designs and, and books. But he also engages these people in, in a conversation about the political economy of farming in, in what all of them expect to be a post-mercantilist world. Sinclair and Young were, were um, very disturbed by the loss of the American colonies and what this meant for the future of Great Britain. And they see in this correspondence with Washington the opportunity to um, talk more broadly about government, governmental role in agricultural improvement. Um, in fact, Sinclair convinces Washington to um, look for, um, to, to propose a board of agriculture. Um, it doesn't, Madison wants no part of it. Hamilton's less interested, but Washington includes it in his last annual message to Congress. And he's convinced that America will fall behind the kind of improvement he sees in Great Britain if it doesn't also um, provide this kind of governmental um, uh, support for, um, for agriculture. And also this group, um, they help Washington think about new ways of being connected with the wider world. And I think it's very important to understand that Washington did not turn away from the Atlantic world after independence. Um, he, he sees America's future as deeply engaged. Um, he had hoped it would be more engaged with the French than it turns out to be, um, but certainly with the British. And, and it's as much a cultural connection as anything else. He sees this as a natural um, partnership for sharing information that will rebound to the commercial benefit of both Great Britain and the United States. Yeah, so like you mentioned the new husbandry and for people who are listening, that's with the capital N and a capital H. I mean, it, it, it's a thing. Um, and it's a movement that starts in the early to mid 18th century in Great Britain. And as Bruce said, you know, Washington gets involved in it in the 1750s and 1760s. And then of course in the 1770s, the revolution happens. Um, now, you know, a lot of historians have written or have tried to sort of tease out or puzzle out the kind of, you know, ambivalent or ambiguous relate cultural relationship um, between the now independent United States um, and Great Britain during the post-revolutionary period. Um, you know, I think you've explained really well already how like a guy sitting in Virginia gets interested in the capital M, capital H, new husbandry, which is a British import when he's a loyal subject of the king. Um, but I mean, does the revolution change any of that? Or, or I mean, it clearly doesn't change his um, correspondence with people like Young and Sinclair, but, but um, you know, is, is he still okay with the Britishness of all of this or, or is he trying to make it into something distinctly American? I mean, what's going on with that? Absolutely not trying to make it something distinctly American. He, um, and it's not so much a provincial insecurity. He really sees that the future is in this collaboration across national boundaries. Um, He's not alone in deferring to, to, to British agricultural experts. Um, it, it, on the European continent, people consult these same books. Frederick of Prussia, who is one of the first um, national leaders to um, present his agricultural improvements as a national service, a public service. Um, one of the first things he does is he um, hires a farmer from 
um, England to come advise him in Prussia. And Washington does the same thing. In 1785, he, announced, he writes to his old friend and neighbor, George William Fairfax, who was living in England. And he said, I, I intend to in, introduce a complete course of husbandry um, based on the best farming counties in England. And um, he, the first thing he wants to do is to hire an English farmer. And he asks Fairfax to find him an accomplished English farmer who, who comes to Mount Vernon to advise him. Um, he sees no irony in this selection of, of, of English model for farming. It's what's seen as the most advanced kind of agriculture. And he's extremely critical of American farming. He becomes even more critical throughout the rest of his life. I think more than I anticipated when I started this project, um, his favorite phrase in the late 1790s is that um, he will not rent his land to the slovenly farmers of this country. He will only rent it to an English or Scottish um, farmer. Well, he and, does love Pennsylvania, though, and he loves the Germans in Pennsylvania. Um, I mean, there is some really interesting material in this book about his sort of regional prejudices isn't the right word, but judgments about South Carolina and Pennsylvania and some of these other places. Um, he's extremely judgmental about the Carolinas and Georgia. And part of that is because he does not um, want to see staple agriculture being the foundation of, of um, uh, com um, American commerce, that he does not see that as the future. He's very different from Jefferson on that, who, who tries to find ways to encourage the expansion of staple agriculture and with it in, in uh, enslaved labor systems. Washington is very much focused on um, production of grains and he does come to see that Pennsylvania um, is the leading producer yeah, yeah. of grains. Um, and it's a source of great concern to him because there's always long been this, for, throughout his lifetime, there's been this rivalry between um, Pennsylvania and Virginia, especially for settlement of the West and for commercial access um, to, to Atlantic markets. And he, um, while he's president, he, he's, pays very close attention to farming in Pennsylvania. And he goes out to visit farms. He um, watches very closely he, what they're doing and he'll write his farm manager and explain what the practice is in Philadelphia. Um, but far more profoundly, um, he writes to Sir John Sinclair at the end of his presidency. And he, um, Sinclair's thinking of moving to the United States. He's afraid that the Jacobins will come and take over England and he wants to, to or Great Britain, and he wants to move to the US. And Washington sends a really detailed survey of American agriculture and where he might settle. And he says, Virginia and Maryland are the garden of America, that they have the best soil, they have the best access to um, transportation. Um, but then he says that right now, it's not the leading agricultural society. The leading agricultural society is Pennsylvania, that they've improved land the, the, um, better, they've built better barns, they've improved the value of the land. And then he has several explanations, but the, the most important explanation is he says is that they have passed laws for the gradual abolition of slavery in Virginia and Maryland have not. And there finally, after years of trying to make slavery work within a new system of agriculture, he concedes that slavery and improved British style agriculture are, are antithetical to each other. And I do wanna obviously talk about slavery, which is a big part of the book, but before we move there, um, tell us about the jackasses. <laughs> Um, so the book includes um, what I think is the first published uh, version of a wonderful image of what was called General Washington's Jackass. And it was the cover um, image on a, a 1785 Massachusetts Farmer's Almanac. Uh, it's an image that um, Mount Vernon acquired only fairly recently, um, but it's this very <laughs> strong woodcut image of, of a jackass. Um, and the, it was um, accompanying a story about Washington's first agricultural improvement project following the Revolutionary War, which was he decided he wanted to breed mules. He had learned about uh, mules from the Spanish minister to the US um, um, who had told him that the best mules were those bred from Spanish jackasses. And, um, but Spanish jackasses were prohibited from export. And so Washington sends feelers out to merchants, to, to Lafayette, to a number of people. 
And eventually the king of Spain learns about this and he's so pleased of Washington's interest that he orders that two of the best um, specimens of the animals be shipped to Washington as a present, as a gift. And Washington, only one of them survived the journey, but Washington named the jackass royal gift. And he becomes a kind of celebrity in his own right. They, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, there's that image in the, in the almanac and his progress from Massachusetts to where he landed to Mount Vernon is covered by the newspapers. Um, and then people come from all over bringing their mares to breed with um, uh, royal yeah. gift. Uh, he also, Washington also receives another jackass and two jennies from uh, female asses from Lafayette. So he's able to produce his own breeding stock. And the whole story is very entertaining and it's humorous and Washington is absolutely, can, befuddled when Royal Gift was unable to perform for the first few months he was there. And, um, but he gets that straightened out. And um, by the end of his life, he has more mules uh, working as draft animals at all of his farms than he does horses or oxen combined. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting story beyond the entertaining side because it, it was the first indication of what kind of just global support um, Washington would find for his agricultural improvement projects that all these highest diplomatic circles in Europe are trying to help him out on this. Um, John Jay wants to bring um, um, animals down to breed with royal gifts so that New York can be part of this. When Washington goes to South Carolina to visit the uh, prominent planters there convince him to send royal gift. Um, but there's also another um, um, side of it that's indicative of Washington's agricultural improvement projects, which is he was always aware of what he thought would be the special challenges and problems of introducing this kind of agriculture in a, in, on a plantation totally dependent on enslaved labor. And only to Lafayette does he acknowledge that his real interest in finding mules and in bringing more mules to Virginia is that he thinks they will withstand what he considers the careless treatment of um, enslaved laborers and the draft animals. Right. And they were supposed to be stronger and cheaper to maintain too. Right? They're much cheaper to maintain. They live longer, but also he somehow thought they, um, but it can show you he goes into this aware that, um, or at least he's assuming there will be challenges um, trying to introduce this kind of uh, agriculture on the state that's, that he's determined will also be so completely reliant on enslaved labor. There is an enormous amount of agricultural information conveyed in, I think, a very interesting and accessible way in this book. Um, I'm not a farmer. I'm not even a very good gardener, but I feel like I learned a lot and, and, and it, was, it was a really good read. All right, let's pivot um, and turn to um, the issue of slavery and slave labor and abolitionism and then ultimately Washington's will, which was really quite a remarkable document that we sort of mentioned already without really going into a lot of detail about. Um, you know, as should be clear by now, um, Washington owned and profited from the work of enslaved people for his entire adult life. Um, but one of the things that you can see in Bruce's book is that his use of enslaved workers and his attitudes toward Black people um, changed over the course of his life. Um, could you talk a bit about that? Um, I mean, yes, you're, you're, you're right that um, Washington's, um, for Washington's whole lifetime, um, his engagement with farming was inseparable from his reliance on enslaved labor. He inherits the first enslaved laborers when he's 11, um, from when his father dies. His earliest memories of farming would have been um, watching first his father and then his mother um, direct the work of enslaved field laborers. Um, but also from the time he um, takes over Mount, or assumes full-time management of Mount Vernon in 1759, um, he's trying to adapt enslaved labor to new kinds of farming. He's trying to invest new value in his investment in um, enslaved laborers. He um, has, Enslaved laborers working with him from the first time he's developing new plows and planting new kinds of grasses 
Um, when he transitions from tobacco to wheat, it in no way lessens his um, demand for um, the work of enslaved laborers. In fact, he continues to buy more, um, and he will continue to buy more enslaved laborers up until um, the Revolutionary War. Um, Something does change dramatically during the revolution. There's no questions. No one, no one, no one um, could um, experience the period of the American Revolution, particularly you know, in Washington's position, without un understanding how the revolution changed um, everything about slavery and um, the lives of, of enslaved people. He was certainly well aware of, of just how many enslaved um, blacks um, use the opportunities in, uh, of, of the war to um, fight against their own bondage and to try and find permanent freedom and refuge with, with the British, um, including um, a number of enslaved people from Mount Vernon. Um, but, and also during the Revolutionary War, Washington is exposed for the first time to a new anti-slavery movement. Uh, and it's an anti-slavery movement that um, some of the most articulate advocates are friends of his, um, most notably Lafayette. Um, and so by the time he comes back to Mount Vernon and in, um, institutes this very ambitious and very demanding kind of um, new program of farming. Um, he does make an effort in his mind to, to make um, slavery somehow less brutal. And he tries to um, guarantee that there will be certain provisions made for, um, for proper food and medical care. He decides he will no longer be involved in the purchase or sale of enslaved laborers. He will try to protect families. And he makes an effort to um, reduce the incident of violence and violent coercion of, of labor. But at the same time he does that, um, he makes a conscious decision and, and very decisive effort to become even more reliant on enslaved labor. He, um, he replaces several of his white overseers with enslaved overseers. He tries to replace many of the hired white artisans with um, enslaved carpenters or bricklayers. Um, and he also um, tries to develop a system that will extract their labor more efficiently. And he develops this highly original account of, of work reports on a weekly basis um, that he thinks will somehow make slavery operate more rationally and humanely. It's interesting, Jefferson very briefly tries to do the same thing. Um, and it's his eventual disillusionment with that attempt um, is what I think then leads to his decision to um, find some way to move away from uh, reliance on enslavery in some way to free the enslaved people that he controlled legally. Okay, and so you mentioned abolitionist um, Lafayette being one of them, but, but there were others as well. And I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is that the anti-slavery movement arises in the United States after revolution. And all of these abolitionists or white abolitionists at least are appealing directly to Washington repeatedly um, in a way that they don't appeal to any of the other men really that we consider to be the founders. Why do you think that was? Um, yeah, I, I think nowadays we, we wonder why, why weren't they appealing to Thomas Jefferson as the author of the Declaration, the Declaration of Independence. Right. And I think it's what we would see as the great um, 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 contradiction and, and hypocrisy. But it was Washington who's the uh, most important and prominent um, target of these abolitionists, many of whom were people who greatly respected him. And I think it's because Washington was seen at the time in, um, as the, not just a military hero, but also he was described as the champion of American liberty. That he was, um, as one of the abolitionists says when he comes to Mount Vernon to ask Washington to establish an abolitionist society in Virginia, he, he says that the savior of America, meaning um, Washington should also be the savior of the several hundred thousand um, enslaved blacks who are in his country. Um, the first person who appeals to Washington is Lafayette. And Lafayette um, said, if now that your military career is coming to an end, if you were just a Julius Caesar or just a Frederick the Great, I'd feel <laughs> sorry for you. But you're Washington and your role now is to help this nation be a success, to bring it together, to establish a solid federal union. But he said, the first thing I would suggest you do and hope you'll do is to join with me, meaning Lafayette, in an experiment to um, uh, train enslaved laborers to be a self-sufficient independent um, uh, laborers who would then be made tenants. Um, 
And that's just the first of many appeals. Um, the religious leaders come to Mount Vernon, the Methodist clergy want support for a petition for gradual abolition, uh, Quaker leaders who come to him as president and ask him to support um, restrictions on the, on the slave trade. Um, and then um, um, abolitionists who come from Great Britain and France directly to appeal to Washington. And then there are those that are not friendly or supportive that are highly, highly critical, particularly in the press. And these appeals to Washington continue for the rest of his life. And they're usually the same kind of language that um, the Cincinnatus of America who um, secured liberty for um, uh, all white Americans should now be extending it to um, the enslaved. And there's always an assumption that if Washington supports abolition and if Washington emancipates his own enslaved laborers, that somehow it would um, um, convince other people to do the same thing. Which of course didn't work out that way, right? Because yeah. the emancipates um, the enslaved people who he owned in his will and Martha's would later follow. Um, we're actually running out of time. So, I mean, I guess we can talk more about the will and the Q of A because there's one question that I really, really want to get a chance to ask you. Um, enough about George Washington. Um, obviously, George Washington is clearly the star of the show, the most important character in your book. Um, but this book is full of interesting people. Um, so aside from George Washington, um, of the, all the people in this book, um, who is your favorite and why? Um, well, the most intriguing and the, and the person I wish I knew so much more about is Davy Gray, who is um, the longest serving enslaved overseer at Mount Vernon. He probably knew more about farming at Mount Vernon than anyone, including Washington. He's an enslaved overseer, meaning the supervisor of labor and supervisor of farming and various um, of the farms over a 30 year period. And he's there during the two great gaps in Washington's um, service as a farmer. He's there during the Revolutionary War and there during um, Washington's presidency. Um, he had started out as a field laborer who learned very valuable skill of cradling wheat. He then is made one of the, uh, the only the second enslaved overseer. Um, but what's particularly as intriguing is that he obviously had a, a special relationship with Washington, that Washington relied on him for information about the condition of uh, the living conditions of the enslaved or the working conditions. He also seems to have given him a special field called Davies Field where there was experimental work done. Um, and, um, and um, he defers to Gray when Gray says he doesn't want to move from one farm to the other. Washington backs off. Um, and Gray, he, he was paid a small amount of money every year by Washington. He probably used that to buy the poultry that he then raises and sells to the Washington family. After Washington dies, um, he has enough money to, uh, when, when the uh, farm is sold off or the implements and livestock are sold off, Gray buys a cow. Um, but he's unable to secure his own freedom. He was one of the so-called dower slaves, and therefore he um, uh, was held by the, owned by the Custis estate, and he's um, um, sent off to, to live with one of the Custis granddaughters when, um, after Martha dies. So. All right, I think um, we, we're yeah. actually, we're out of time, um, and sure. we need to move on to the Q&A from the audience, but thank you for that. Great conversation, Bruce. Um, and I think we do have a few questions um, in the Q&A section. And so I think um, I will start asking some of them. And if people want to sort of piggyback on and add more questions, um, that is fine as well. We've got about 17 minutes, if my math is correct, um, for questions. Um, okay, we're going to start with the very first one. Someone submitted a question at 311, very early in the presentation. So I think um, we'll give this question from Joseph Mitchell precedent. So I'm allowed to say people's names, I think, right? Because other one, yes, yeah, okay, if they say them. Um, okay, so here it is. Earlier, you referred to the voluminous body of farming and financial records that Washington held, but specified that many of these records were not published. Why do you suppose they would not have been published? And what do you think would be the benefit of publishing them? Um, I would imagine the average American might not be interested in reading George Washington's paper book. Really, you think? I don't know, Bruce would be interested, clearly. 
um, some of it, some of them have been published. Um, the, he kept these weekly work reports that I said were so important for understanding how he tried to control enslaved labor and to see what they're doing in this new farming system. A great majority of those have not been published. Some of the account books have now been put online and can be searched, but many others have not. And um, the most important reason to get access to those is that those are by far the most detailed record of the lives of the enslaved. Um, the enslaved had no means of leaving their own imprint on the historical record. And so their, their lives are documented mostly in terms of um, accounts and work reports and a sense of, of Washington's value of them. But it's really there that we can discern so much about the enslaved community that doesn't appear anywhere else. Yeah, no, I think that's, um, and some of these um, documents also have been published um, with financial records more recently online. You can get them, they're free, uh, but I'm inclined to agree with Joseph that most average Americans would not necessarily want to do that. Um, okay. Um, we're gonna take a question now from Julie Miller, who is actually reading the book and she says she's enjoying it. Um, I'm wondering if you discovered any evidence that Washington was aware of the labor practices used at the Crowley Iron Works, which E.P. Thompson wrote about. Um, the Crowley Law Books, um, since, he dealt, since Washington dealt regular with Th Theodosia Crowley, who ran the Iron Works during Washington's lifetime. I've never seen any evidence that he knew about the, the works there or what uh, the labor was. He certainly knew about Theodosia Crowley and um, <clears throat> she took over the ironmonger business from her husband when he died. And she's particularly important to Washington because she is manufacturing a lot of farming implements that are used on the great improved estates in Great Britain. And Washington through his um, London Merchants has access to that same material culture and that same technology. So that's as far as I know about Theodosia Crowley, but um, uh, not if he was aware of her um, labor systems. Or... No, no, that's, that's a good answer. Um, okay, you know, one of the um, attendees um, raised the issue of, of our sort of terminology um, when we talk about agriculture. Um, and so like one of the things that you sort of talked about in passing, one of the terms you used um, was this idea of staple agriculture, um, which you contrast with grain. Um, and I mean, I think we know what grain is, but how is it different from, so, well, grain is actually a kind of staple agriculture, kind of staple. But, but for, okay, so talk a bit about, I guess, the agricultural economy of Virginia in particular and, and the way those two things sort of work together. And those staple crops are usually considered the cash crops that are not comestibles. They're, um, they're things like tobacco and, um, well, sugar could be a, is a staple too. Um, but the, and they're the crops that are usually associated with um, uh, enslaved labor and slavery plantations. Um, Washington people would not have used the term staple to apply to um, mixed grains, small grains. Um, okay. And so going back to your point about the Navigation Acts, which was the Imperial Trade Regulation System, um, they also pinpointed staple crops, cash crops, for instance, all tobacco had to go to British ports. And that was not true of, of grain, which is one of the sort of big ideas um, about Washington and agriculture and, and his ideas about the benefits of grain over tobacco um, in this particular instance. Um, okay, we have a question from Stephen Mink. Washington had farm properties in various locations, including up the Potomac River, and was involved in land development in the Ohio River Valley. Did his agricultural experimentation extend to these distant properties, and was he trying different things in different places, given their agricultural and economic specifics and circumstances? That's a great question. Yes. Um... There are initially attempts to do that, but Washington pretty quickly, uh, around between 1765, 1767, decides to what he says, draw all my forces together at Mount Vernon. And he takes the land in the West. He had, had a very active tobacco plantation in um, the West called Bullskin Plantation. It also then became a large producer of hemp, which um, hemp production was very big in that part of Virginia. Um, and he decides 
Russia is very leery of managing an estate from afar. He's very leery of relying on overseers from afar. When he does it, he has a bad experience. So he, um, his preferred organization of land after um, 1767 is to lend it, let it out to tenants. And he, he transfers bullskin over to tenants. When he buys new land in the Piedmont, he puts that under tenants. Um, and the only time he makes an exception is when he um, patents land in Pennsylvania and in the Ohio country. And by law, he has to um, improve that land within a few years to cement the claim. But again, he does not plan to permanently farm those areas. His plan is to settle them with tenants. Um, it's often thought his, he's speculating in land to wait for it to increase in value, but he thought the increase in the value would come from settling very large number of tenants on those Western lands. Okay, we have a lot of really good questions about slavery, and rather than answering them in the order in which they came, I'm going to try and ask them in an order in which kind of your answers will sort of work chronologically and, and nest into each other. And so anonymous attendee asked, did the fact that the Continental Army had a significant number of black soldiers have an effect on Washington's attitude towards slavery? It's a very good question and people ask it. Um, there's no answer to it that I can come up with. There certainly was no, um, Washington never says anything. He never assesses um, the um, quality of the service of those um, uh, blacks who served in the Continental Army. Um, he is involved in debates over the um, enlistment of blacks and of, of, of um, enslaved blacks. Um, Washington's greatest concern about um, the participation of, of blacks in the military during the revolution is that he thinks that um, service with the British will always be um, um, preferable to American. And about by about two to one, he was right, um, which isn't to um, um, in any way discount the, the service of those um, blacks who fought for the Patriot cause, but Washington never comments on it. And it certainly, um, I don't think it changed his um, attitude toward Blacks or toward slavery. Well, and in fact, I mean, and here is another kind of more specific question about Washington's relationships with African-Americans um, from Sally Nista. Um, if Washington's views about enslavement evolved, why was he so determined to recapture on a judge, which is a great story, right? And a great question. Um, and um, it's, it's one of those things that's really hard for us to come to fully understand this. Even after Washington um, had decided he wanted to free the enslaved at Mount Vernon and he goes to great lengths to find a way to do it. Um, and even, even after he writes his, um, his will, he is determined to protect his property rights, rights in the enslaved. And he, he is doing that up until the end of his life that he, um, his explanation with Ona Judge is that um, it would be unfair to um, give her um, freedom and um, uh, leave others um, in enslavement. But he, he's always determined to protect his property rights in, in, um, in slave property. And, and even after he's decided that slavery is, is wrong. Which does then he's also he's also determined to extract as much labor. He um, you know in the six months after he writes his will, he's trying to find ways to more productively um, use the enslaved labor he has. He's he has even has a fairly elaborate plan to um, settle um, enslaved laborers from Mount Vernon on his western land. He wants to take back land from his tenants so that he can move the enslaved out there. And this is after he's written his will. It's. Okay, which leads us into the question that I was hoping that someone asked because we didn't have time to talk, the, talk about the will. And Nancy Appleby says, I would love to hear more about Washington's will. So tell us about the will, Bruce. Right, the, the will famously provides um, for the emancipation of all of the enslaved people um, that Washington had legal control over, which, at the time he wrote the will is over 120 people, but as um, you mentioned earlier, um, a majority of the enslaved people at Mount Vernon are what were called dower slaves. They are um, controlled by the Custis estate. Washington, as the husband of Martha Custis, had 
rights to their labor during his lifetime, but he cannot um, free them, he cannot sell them. Um, and they remain enslaved. And um, he said he explains that he cannot do that in his will. Um, I think what beyond that is, is most interesting about the will is that Washington went to great lengths to make sure no one could challenge the provisions of the um, uh, emancipation of the enslaved. There had been, um, manumission had been legal since 1782, but ever since that law was passed, people in the Virginia assembly were trying to restrict the ability to manumit enslaved. And especially in the 1790s, there are uh, growing uh, legislation that restricts the uh, flexibility of the um, enslaver to to free them. Um, and Washington answers every one of those possible challenges. He, um, the first thing um, he says in his will before he provides for the emancipation is for the payment of all his debts, which were quite inconsequential. But under Virginia law, someone could choose to have any debt paid um, in slave property rather than in money. Um, he, um, Washington also wanted to make sure that no one removed um, the enslaved people from Virginia before the terms of, of the emancipation would be met, meaning the death of, of Martha. And in um, and by, a lot of people have wondered why he delays the emancipation um, until um, after the death of Martha. He explains it because he didn't want her to see the, the painful um, feelings that would be um, expressed when the many families that would be separated were separated because there were so many marriages between the dower slaves and the enslaved that were controlled by Washington. Um, but by delaying that emancipation, Washington also makes it impossible for any of um, Martha's relatives um, to challenge it. And under Virginia law, um, the family of a widow could uh, claim rights to one third of the enslaved, even if the person who wrote the will wanted them all um, enslaved. So I think Washington is making sure that there's absolutely no chance anyone can challenge this. And also he goes to great lengths to make sure that the people that he frees will also be productive members of society, or at least self-supporting. Um, that he in, uh, insists that uh, those that were infirm or too old or too young would um, be given support, and that any of the children whose parents could not support them would be um, hired out as indentured servants, but um, the, their um, people who hired them would be required to teach them to read and write and to teach a trade. And those are provisions that normally only apply to white orphans, not to um, freed slave children. Slave children. Okay, um, and for any of you who are interested, really interested in looking at Washington's will, if you Google it, you will find it online. And it really is this remarkable, very precise, very methodical document where, I mean, I think the kind of personality that, that Bruce has sort of described um, really comes through in, in the sort of care with which he put together that document. All right, um, I think we have time for one more question because it's kind of, a complicated one, but I think a really interesting one and in some ways um, a timely one and a good one for us to end with. Um, and this comes from anonymous attendee, presumably a different anonymous attendee than the other one, but maybe not. Um, and this question is, how should we modern day people judge the morality of slaveholders whose livelihoods depended on slavery and who saw slavery all around them and accepted by white society of their day? Boy, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, well, in the case of Washington, I think the judgment should be made in terms of the world in which Washington lived, in which many, many people who he deeply respected were also very strongly opposed to slavery. And that for 20 years, Washington is hearing why slavery is wrong and he's hearing about why it also is um, not just antithetical to the kind of agricultural improvement that he um, um, is pursuing, but also that it's contrary to the principles of the revolution and the principles of liberty that he's so closely associated with. So I think the standards of the time are those of people like Lafayette and Brousseau and um, the others who um, called on Washington and who I think Washington ultimately hears, and, um, even if he does not want to publicly um, um, associate himself with, with the abolitionists, he does so just by his action and example. 
And that Washington always thought, you know, we wish he had said something stronger condemning slavery within his will. But throughout Washington's life, he thinks his actions and his example are how you um, make a point, not by trying to publicly persuade people of something. So um, I think in the end, his example affirmed those who had been calling on him um, to join in this growing movement um, for abolition. And that is such an important point. I mean, I think, you know, until relatively recently, um, you know, the sort of historical record obscured the fact that there were so many people, um, certainly African-Americans, but also um, white people who were very articulate in their denunciation of slavery and their call for um, its abolition, um, you know, whether gradually or immediately. And I think that, you know, there's plenty of good scholarship out there now that, that makes that point. Um, and I think Bruce's wonderful new book is, is in some ways sort of part of that um, kind of growing recognition that um, the past is actually a whole lot more complicated than, than many sort of past views of it have led us to believe. Um, you know, there are plenty of anti-slavery people um, in Virginia, some of them are out there and public and really doing stuff. Um, and then I think in a lot of ways, Washington was probably more typical and that he was kind of maybe quietly anti-slavery, um, but he was also really special because he was George Washington and he had so many enslaved people who were affected by his will and by um, you know, his emancipating them um, on his death in 1799. Um, so I guess that's it. We're actually at 401. Um, that was totally awesome. Um, yeah. I guess I'm done. Well, great, great moderating, Cynthia and, and Bruce. You know, hopefully your your book will succeed in restoring the reputation that wa Washington had in his uh, his own lifetime as America's most celebrated farmer. Uh, and, and, and in any case, I'm sure the book will provide all who read it with a with a much fuller understanding. Uh, of Washington, uh, the importance that agriculture had in his life and, and in shaping his vision of America, and particularly the evolution of his views of, of slavery. Uh, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of Washington at the Plow. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read.